Chapter 3, Two Symbolic Photos When the crisis erupted at Little Rock Central High School, newspaper photographer Will Counts had an edge. He was a hometown boy, born and raised in Arkansas. Even more important, he was a former Central High student. Only about a decade before, he discovered his passion for photography in the same school that was later surrounded by soldiers. Counts put both his passion and hometown knowledge to use September 4th, 1957. He knew the layout of the campus. That morning, he dressed in an everyday plaid shirt for work. He planned to blend in with the crowd, unlike the suit-and-tie newsmen from the big cities. And unlike many of the photographers who hoped to take their time and get one perfect shot, Counts had a different strategy. He figured the more photos he shot, the more likely he'd get the ideal photograph. It was a matter of improving his odds. Counts also used a small camera, one that didn't draw attention like the large professional cameras used by other photographers. He could shoot 36 exposures with his 35 millimeter Nikon S2 before he had to reload, a huge advantage over the other photographers who had to reload their speed graphic cameras after every shot. The small camera let him slip through the crowds and get close to the action. While other photographers were content capturing your average newspaper photo, people milling around the high school, soldiers standing guard, young counts was always where the action was. People were marching and screaming and protesting. They were on the move and counts was right in front of them, said an article in the Arkansas Leader published after his death in 2001. When the crowd of protesters confronted Elizabeth Eckford with threats and jeers, Counts was ready. He managed to get in front of the crowd. He had a wide-angle lens to get the shot he wanted, Elizabeth against a backdrop of angry people. But the crowd kept pressing forward, making it difficult for Counts to get any pictures, let alone a good one. He had to run backward awkwardly, trying to avoid tripping to stay in front of the mob. Click, click, click. Counts had snapped a high-quality, technically sound picture. That much he knew. But Counts had no idea that a single photograph would become a magnifying glass for race relations in the United States. For him, it was community journalism, even though it was a national story, said Jim Kelly, an Indiana University professor who knew Counts. He wasn't there as a stranger. I don't know that he knew those two women, but he knew the situation— he knew what it was like to go to a segregated school. The photo helped build his career. The Associated Press named it one of the top 100 photographs of the 20th century. Counts was nominated for a Pulitzer Prize, the highest award in American journalism, for photographs he took during the Central High Conflict. Counts took another photo later that also made international news. L. Alex Wilson, an African-American journalist, was attacked outside Central High by a man wielding a brick. Count snapped a photo, and the image of Wilson's beating is among those that prompted national leaders to take action. Years later, the photo was selected by Encyclopedia Britannica as one of the world's 50 most memorable photos of the preceding 50 years. Counts took a very different path with his photography after the conflict at Central High. After working as a photographer for the Associated Press, he joined the journalism faculty at Indiana University, where he earned a Ph.D. During his 32 years of teaching at Indiana, Count said he used the Little Rock photos in just about every course. I always cited them as evidence of the power of the image to communicate the news. I have always believed that good news reporting, both pictures and words, did make a difference in Little Rock. Counts kept his students focused on the essentials of photojournalism, said Kelly. For you to do less than your best was a breach of the trust that subjects were placing in you, he said Counts told his students. It was always about journalism. We talk about cameras, lenses, and film, but it was primarily about getting the story right. Through the years, Counts never stopped thinking about Elizabeth Eckford and Hazel Bryan. His most famous work would be the photos of the conflict in Little Rock 
and of the reconciliation of the two women many years later. He documented their meeting in the book A Life is More Than a Moment, The Desegregation of Little Rock's Central High. On the 40th anniversary of the Little Rock Crisis, a reconciliation celebration was planned to show the world that Little Rock's citizens had moved forward peacefully and had learned to cooperate and accept one another. President Bill Clinton would hold open the doors while nine former students, now adults, entered Central High School. Counts would be there in 1997, and a powerful symbol of change, Counts would again photograph the two women from his famous picture, but this time the image would represent a hopeful future rather than a shameful past. Counts did not know that six years after the conflict, Hazel Bryan Massery had called Elizabeth Eckford to apologize for her behavior. Hazel was afraid a single photograph had forever cast her as a hateful racist. She believed she had been too young in 1957 to truly have her own beliefs. In those difficult times, Hazel told people she had reflected the beliefs of her family, friends, and community. With a few phone calls in 1997, Counts asked the women to meet. Massery, now a grandmother, was eager to shed the image created by the photo. I knew that my life was more than a moment, she said. Counts was not sure Eckford would agree to the meeting. A shy child and a quiet woman, she had never embraced her role as the face of the civil rights movement. She typically had refused media interviews and speaking requests. But to his surprise, Eckford, who lives in Little Rock, told Counts she would participate. Forty years after they had made world news, the women came together for a new photograph at Central High School. They talked. They put their arms around each other. They smiled for the camera, and Count snapped another photo. The photo appears on a poster titled Reconciliation, with the original photo in a corner. Sold at visitor's centers near the school, each poster has a sticker with a quote from Eckford. True reconciliation can occur only when we honestly acknowledge our painful but shared past. Something else happened as the camera clicked. Seeds for a relationship were planted. Elizabeth and Hazel became friends. Soon they began speaking publicly about the past that haunted them both. They met with reporters and spoke to groups about the conflict. They considered writing a book and they appeared together on the Oprah Winfrey show. The women's friends and family members thought the relationship was odd and perhaps forced. Some people accused Massery of seeking the media attention that Eckford had spent a lifetime avoiding. Other members of the Little Rock Nine weren't sure what to think. We kind of joked about it, Ernest Green said. Here she is, framed forever with her mouth spewing out whatever she was spewing out. And no matter what she does in life, she can't erase that photo. Eckford began to have doubts too. She wondered whether Massery was truly sorry. The friendly relationship did not last, and the women no longer appear in public together. Count's widow, Vivian, called the reconciliation photo one of her husband's most cherished works. The meeting Counts helped set up was an attempt to reconcile, an attempt to heal some of those wounds, she said. I'm just glad he did not know how things have turned around and how the wounds have reopened for those two women.